There you go. <laughs> right. So. Okay, feet parallel, below your hips, and weight a little bit forwards, and just get that feeling of gently settling back. A lot of what we're doing is allowing the body to come into this position. So from the side here, this is exaggerated, but if I'm a long way forward in, in my toes, and I'm about to fall over, of course. Um, one, one common habit when we do this is to lean back like this, but you can see it's doing dreadful things to my back and my arms in back. Um, a more, in a way, an older, a more kind of natural way is just to let this feeling of your hips dropping back. And you, see, you notice, by and large, my knees stay in pretty much the same position. They might move forward a little bit, but you should be able to look down and see your toes poking out beyond your knees. So this is just a, a small adjustment that we want to get used to and get a feeling that we're able to just settle, to relax into them. Now that takes a while, of course, because you know, you're taking a position that is probably, for some of you at least, a little bit unusual, and that will make the muscles work harder, but keep your knees soft and hips and ankles. Another way of thinking of this is that they say, imagine a little round ball, a soft ball, what? one in front of each ankle, one in front of each hip, and one behind each knee. Just different ways of looking at the same thing. And the overall feeling is that you're resting into something and what you're resting into is your legs. So you get a feeling of your pelvis hanging down almost as though you can feel the pull on the base of the spine. Gradually just giving yourself time to settle into the posture, which will itself help to create that little bit of space in your body. And allow for a little bit of movement and then the movement just picks up. You warm up physically a little bit, start to just ease some of those tighter areas with your body settling into a nice steady rhythm. All the things that hopefully you're becoming familiar with and comfortable with. So try not to just move your arms. If I put my hand on my belly, put you put your hand on your belly there. So just, just do this and see, see how my body's turning. This is the movement I want you to do. And you can see my arms, my arms are doing nothing. But this is a bit of an awkward position. So I let my arms drop down. And because they're dropping down, they're swinging around. So don't stand there doing this. It's not the arms, it's the center of the body. Imagine you've got a little spotlight in your navel. I have a feeling that you're pulling your arms around. If I exaggerate, by exaggerating, my posture will go out, my knees will go out of line, by the way, but maybe that's easier for you to see. And you imagine doing this in water. So that image of resistance programs your body to move in such a way you can start to feel the connection you know, from your hip to your shoulder to your hand. Another way you can imagine this is that you've got quite kind of heavy weights or heavy shopping bags in each hand. And so you're having to generate a little bit of a pull on your arms. So this single exercise really helps you with your overall posture and quality of movement. And in particular emphasizes the turning in the center of your body. I often see people just doing this. 
moving their arms. And the thing to think about here is that what you see in Tai Chi is not what you've got to do. What you see is the end result of what you ideally will be doing. So the, the temptation is always to kind of like go, oh, right, I'll do this. And it's not that. If you want to exercise your arms, do, do weight training or something like, something like that. But Tai Chi works on the whole body. And that middle part of your body is the part of your body that connects upper and lower, left and right, and so on and so forth. It's regarded as being the hub of the wheel. Also, some of you are lifting your hands up. Look where my hands are going. They're hanging all the way down. I'm not doing anything with my hands, except allowing them to follow the body because it would be too much hard work to stop them. So when you turn, the front hand lands about on your front hip. The bottom hand, around about the, the area just below the small of your back. Because proportionally, we're all the same, mostly. So getting your posture correct at this point is a great help. And when you raise your arms, it's usually easier here to get that sense of your body turning. So your hands come up and out to about that, that, that point, elbows hanging down. So you've got a ball in each hand now, so fingers spread out. and let your hands drop down. Now put one foot in front. Notice the width of my step. I haven't gone here because at this point I'm going to start wobbling around. I need to keep that width of the step and I'm moving my weight from front to back and I'm just letting my body turn. Don't worry too much about which way it turns. But again, you'll see as my body turns, my arms follow. So this is also a very good exercise and actually contains in, 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 in one simple exercise, really everything you need to build up the movements. So remember the sort of saying that in Tai Chi, the movement is rooted in your feet. And we can take that at the moment as being, well, okay, my weight is sinking, my center of gravity is sinking. Released in the legs, because if you look, you'll see, again, I'm exaggerating a bit. My, my weight is going forwards and backwards. Back leg, front leg, back leg, front leg. Knees don't straighten. They don't do this or this. If I do this, it begins to throw my posture out and can damage the knee joint. Controlled by the center of the body, directed by the center of the body. So this area between hips and waist is turning as I move. And because it's turning, my shoulders are moving, my arms are moving, my hands are moving. And so the movement is expressed in your arms. Rooted in the feet, released in your legs, controlled in the center of your body, expressed in your arms. So, a primary focus is from that center part of your body down in, into the ground. And this requires a switch in your attention. Most people will um, look first to, 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 to the hands. And then on the other side, I remember some years ago, there was a, there was a lovely Chinese woman in, in, in Cambridge who did a bit of Tai Chi. And there was a group of us, she, she was very involved with, with, with the Buddhist community in Cambridge. Um, they happened to be around at one point, we were standing in a park when um, some people asked her to show, to, to show her Tai Chi. Um, 
and I was watching her. And she did it really nicely. It was great. Um, and I happened to mention to a friend of mine who 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 knew her that I finally seen her doing Tai Chi. And when he saw it, he mentioned it to her, and she went, "Ah," she said, "He must have been the one watching my feet." So apparently, she noticed that whilst everybody else was watching what her arms were doing, there was one person there who was avidly watching her feet and her legs. <laughs> and that was me. <laughs> because this is, this is what you learn in Tai Chi. This is what you learn to look for. In the first instance, it's not that the arms are unimportant. And shake out. So we want to reinforce that awareness every day. And those exercises, apart from any other value they have, will, will, will help you to, to do that. So now have your feet parallel. Same posture. So this is your sort of default posture. You, you will never come higher than, than this. Sometimes you may go lower, but you will never come higher than, than this. And then just letting your weight roll forwards and backwards. So this is your weight in your feet and your ankles pivoting. Now, if you go too far, we, we, we know what happens. You fall, you stumble, you stiffen up and so on and so forth. So it's quite a small movement, roughly from the front part of your heel to the ball of the foot. So through, through the arch of your foot. And you imagine doing this in water, so there's that little bit of resistance. Turn your hands, palm forwards, and start with your weight back in your heels. Go forwards and imagine somebody has hold of your hands or the pressure of the water is holding them back. And then when you arrive at the ball of your foot, let your hand come through. And then go back, okay, somebody has hold of your hand. So there's a, a slight delay between your hips moving, the shoulders moving, and then your arms and your hands moving. So once again, you know, rooted in the feet because your weight is sinking down, released in the legs, they're moving, controlled by the center of your body, which is just facing forward, so there's nothing complicated here, and expressed in your arms. Now the flow of the movement, which is, of course, one of the great attractions in Tai Chi is one of the things that everybody notices, first thing that people see really, comes out because we follow that formula. Arms have to do a lot less than we think that they do. Therefore, they begin to relax. And when they relax, we start to recognize the flow coming through. But we feel the flow through the whole of the body, but it builds up into our arms. So again, a useful little exercise, not complicated, and one that can just help us to be reminded of these simple points, feet, legs, hip, waist, and arms. That 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 order of movement. Now this time, let your elbows come in a little bit and your forearms rise. Imagine you're holding a tray of drinks in your hands. So what we want, if, if you're in a room and somebody had a tray of drinks and they came up to you and said, have a drink, you're sort of, no, it's all right, thanks, I've got enough now. When, when, when we carry something like that or a bowl of water, we do so very carefully. And we, we actually try and, you know, if you walk across the room with a bowl of water in your hands, you don't, you don't walk across it all like that because the water is going to go everywhere. You move your body, but you keep your arms as still as possible. And so when we do this, we get a real impression of how the arms feel. And they always will carry the same feeling, this quieter, 
quality, but still quite active. So when you lose this quality, when you can no longer feel this, then we return to that four part saying, bring our attention first of all to our feet and then to our legs and then to the center of our body and then to our arms and our hands, check in at each stage that what we're doing is correct for that exercise. And the next time you come forward, see if you can again let your weight rest just behind the ball of each foot. So you come forwards here. And then you let your hips sink back again. And if you can, let, let them sink down a little bit more. And as you do, bringing your hands in to the ball cradle in position, and then feet push down into the ground, the hips go up, shoulders go up, just drawing your hands up, turn them over so they're resting on the ball. Let your weight drop. Imagine you're in water in a swimming pool or something, and you're just dropping down to push the ball underwater. You can't do it with just your arms. So hips drop, you feel your back lengthen slightly, like a spring being pulled out. And then a split second later, the shoulders follow down. When you push up, hips move first. And it's as though the spring's been pushed, compressed. And then a split second later, your shoulders get pushed up. As you move your arms, let me just come forwards a little bit. You can see, so there, this is actually a, a, a rotation in the shoulder. I'm, I'm moving too, too far. What you want to do, that's better. You can see what I'm not doing is this. So this movement here, you can imagine somebody just rest their hands on your shoulders. This movement seems to be massaging the inside of the shoulder joint and indeed the upper back. So remember that sometimes I will be exaggerating movement to try and exhibit certain points, which will probably mean I'm doing the exercise wrong because as always in Tai Chi, the movements are built up from the inside. And eventually as we become more aware of those movements within the body, we realize that they're really quite small. So you know, when I was moving my shoulder, moving my arm, there was a lot of movement in my shoulder, because it's actually moved when I demonstrated, moving a great deal more than it needs to move. Here, I feel the expansion in belly, solar plexus, pushing my elbows out, and then the contraction. That quiet feeling in your arms and your hands. Fingers spread out just a little bit, and slightly curved. Eventually, that feeling of the joints being slightly rounded, you know, I mentioned holding the ball in, in the joint, spreads to underneath your shoulder, your elbow, and wrists, and the joints of your fingers. Do this one more time. And then it's changing. Wild goose. So again, you can see here, my elbows being pushed out slightly, drawing my fingers up. Again, I'm exaggerating that a little bit. So it's your legs that create the energy that will move your arm. Your legs and your intent, because as you get more familiar with the movements, and as you get more familiar with how the movements are produced, the stuff that I've just been talking about, as you approach the exercise, you're already forming a sort of image, 
a, a memory of feeling and how how the movement is is built up that your body will, will begin to follow. And then part in the clouds. So this way, no part of your body is under strain. And if you feel that you've lost a little bit of range of movement, how far you're moving, then don't, don't let that be a, a particular concern. It could be that you were moving too far before, and creating the tightening in your body that you hadn't realized. But in any case, you, you will eventually get a lot of that movement back. Now, dragon plucks the stars from the sky. Sink down. Once again, I'm going to exaggerate. Watch how my arm builds. I'll push up. The expansion of the body pushes my elbow out. My elbow drops down. And that brings my arm up. And I feel the extension all the way through that side of my body. And then again here, it's dropping down. What I'm not doing, what I'm trying not to do is this, to lift up like that. Not, not all of the exercises we do will be as clear in expressing that build up through your body as, as these are, but they will all follow it. So these initial exercises are a good training just to help you with really with, with the later exercises to get those correct or correct as possible. So one more time. Now with pushing in four directions, we don't go up and down anymore, but you do drop down. So you've already got the downward movement through your body, which is you're yielding to the pull of gravity. You have the upward movement because you haven't fallen over. And so the same thing happens. See how my elbows go out, but then they go above my elbows and push up. Just do the first and the last section a couple of times. And then again, the elbows go out again, I'm exaggerated. Then they drop right down and that ends up with a sideways push. I'll show it like that again, elbows go out, hands go above. Elbows goes out and drop down and you end up pushing out. That's the order you want to feel. It's not necessarily that explicit. And then as you do the expansion, you turn,
pushing you forward on it. So here we really feel how the center of the body works. And in fact, the movement itself on this occasion expands out and you feel your arms coming back to the center. So with the previous exercises, there was a very clear, if you like, mechanical relationship with the hips going up and down. As I said, you've still got that downward and upward flow through your body, the pull of gravity and your body's response to that. But another way you can think of this, which is quite useful, is that in that area in, in the middle of your body, you've got like a ball or balloon. And what happens is the ball gets compressed and then expands and then compressed again. and expands, and this time it also rotates and compressed again, and so on and so forth. And of course, when it expands, the direction we're principally aware of is what our arms are doing, but it would expand in all directions, upwards, sideways, and significantly downwards. So as your arms go up here, we choose that direction, but we sh should also feel a slight increase in the pressure in the soles of our feet, because there is that slight downward movement that helps to keep us grounded. So there's a strong relationship between the middle part of your body, your feet and your legs. And often, depending on the movement, it can be a little bit chicken and egg, whether it's appropriate to think in terms of that expansion in the sense of your body initiating the movement, or whether it's some kind of action on the part of your feet or your legs. It could, it, it could be either, it could be both together, it could be one in front of the, the, the other. It depends how you're viewing the exercise quite often. And then, circling arms. Generally, I would say where there's no obvious visible action on the part of the legs, probably better to keep your attention on the center of your body. And um, when there is an obvious movement, you can add the turn here if it's comfortable, you know, you're transferring the weight or something. Maybe focus on that. But if you do that in your practice, you focus on one or the other, you'll find after a while that you can actually be aware of what both are doing. And of course, that's what we would like to, to, to happen. As I say, it's a chicken and egg situation. I'll come back to that idea in a few moments. Change sides.
And then once again, if it's comfortable, add in the turn. Now row in a boat in the middle of the lake. This time it's a vertical rotation in the area between hips and waist, including the pelvis, hips going back, and then rotating back the other way to bring it to the upright to start all over again. So you might think of this as a forward rotation until you get to this position, and then pelvis rotates backwards and you push up. We take the same posture when we go into polishing the table, but we integrate into that the horizontal rotation as well. Once again, remember that quieter quality with your arms. If they really were resting on a table and your hips went back and your shoulders go forwards, your hands would probably slide along the table in the way that you want them to. So just having them in position, using your body correctly, will get them to move. One more time in each direction. And then just come back and once again, check your posture. So we, we can look at the individual components of a movement, but always remember that Tai Chi is an art that uses the whole of the body, body and mind. So those, those individual components should be seen as a bit like the pieces of a jigsaw. They're part of the whole picture. What we're really aiming for in, in, in the end is, is the whole picture rather than this, that, or the other. And so, you know, talk about your know, feet, legs, hips, waist, that, that kind of area, you know, first in the feet and so on. It, it implies that they're separate, but they're actually not. And I think in particular, as I said, this relationship between the physical centre of the body and the feet can be seen in different ways. Sometimes I use the term centre, and I usually refer to the physical centre. I'm talking about that physical area of, of, of the body, pelvis, hips, waist. Other times, um, I might be referring to the idea of if you like, a concept of the centre, which would embrace the feet and, and the legs as well, because frankly, sometimes it's a bit difficult to tell. Is it the expansion in the centre of the body? Is it the push up from the ground? As I say, it's, it's very much chicken and egg. One example I, I, I do use with people is if you think about, you know, I use the example of the ball, they think about a larger ball or something like a space hopper. If you remember space hoppers, these little bouncy things that you could bounce around on. And actually that, that physically extends that whole area from the center of the body to, to your feet. 
And in a space hopper, you'd have to drop down to get the compression, but then you get the bounce up and, and so on and so forth. It's not a bad analogy for the process that goes on in Tai Chi. We can choose to look at a, different, a, a particular aspect of it, but ultimately we want to try and get our attention in, into the whole of the body. So uh, I've, I've talked about this idea of looking out over the sea or looking out over the, 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 the valley. We want to get to a point where we can retain a sense of the whole landscape and yet at the same time, if appropriate, focus on particular parts of that, of, of that landscape. So now put one foot forward. Once again, think about the um, dimensions of your stance, the width of your hips, and about the same in length. It might be that for some of you, if you're settling down more, then you, you can step a little bit longer. If I can sink down a bit more, I can generally step a little bit longer. But you're aiming to be able to move your weight forwards and backwards, retaining that upright position. So I've shown some of you this before. Hold on a second. Let me just get what I'm looking for. When I take this pole, when I stand in the parallel stance, what I'm looking for is roughly a line from the crown of my head down through the middle of my body, arriving just behind the board of my feet. When I go to the forward stance, as I move, can you see, I'm not doing this or this in most instances. I'm actually moving on my feet, if you like, on my legs. Now, try, try doing this. This is a, an interim thing. Settle into your back foot, and then you sink into your back leg, and you feel the pressure there, like you would if you were sitting on the ball, and just let it push you up. Now going up and over, and then drop down. And then again, feel the pressure taking you up and over and down. Again, don't lock your knees. Now I'm getting you to do this so that you can feel more um, emphatically that sense of a push from your legs that comes from the sinking of your weight into your legs. So you've got to go down before you can go up. This is usually regarded as an incorrect way of doing this exercise. You wouldn't aim to let your shoulders and your hips go up and down like this. But it's, it, it's, a, it's a useful way of just feeling the energy coming from your legs. And feeling that the sinking down is, is the thing that begins that energy. So the yielding to the pull of gravity is a key process in Tai Chi. Like you know, if you're on a trampoline and you wanted to bounce up, you'd have to drop down first. And then, you know, when you've done this, begin to just level off so that you're not actually coming up. And this is where you apply your intent. Oh, right, I don't want to go up and down. I want to go forwards and backwards. And part of the Tai Chi training is, is to make our bodies more responsive to those sort of instructions. So now hips are more or less level. There may be a little bit of up and down movement, which for some people um, really shouldn't happen, but a lot of people aren't too sort of concerned by it. Um, a little bit is fine. So you're getting about 70% of your weight into your back foot when you go back. When you go forward, about 60 percent so still at this point not a huge movement but now use the pole again when i go into my back foot there you see the pole hasn't quite reached the foot anyway and then what i want to do is i just flex my front ankle and my toes come up i haven't done this because i'm going to fall over if i do that and then when i go forwards i get to about here 
and then I let my back knee fold inwards and my heel comes up. I'm not doing this. Look all over. Now both those movements, the flexion of your ankle in, in, in the front, the folding of your knee that draws your heel up in the back, involve a dropping in your hips, both hips, or feeling of releasing in your hips. You can also have your front foot turned out here. So gradually what happens is more and more of your weight goes into your leg, retaining that alignment. You're supported by your legs, by your hips, by your back and your spine. The front of your body, including your rib cage, feeling almost as though it's hanging down slightly. So there's no tightness here, and plenty of space for you. Breathe in and all the other internal processes. And then stepping in. I've had a number of people over the years feedback to me that they feel that Tai Chi has helped with their high blood pressure. I think there's various reasons for that, but one a clear reason, I think, is that high blood pressure can, can result from pressure in the veins and arteries, the arteries mostly. They can become clogged up, they can, uh, they, they can get a bit stiffer and harder with age, so they're, you know, it's, it's harder to push through. And, and that means the heart has to work harder and it's like a traffic jam, you know, the, the, the pressure of the blood builds up. But the space that we create physically in our body can, to a certain extent, counteract that. There's other things that are involved in high blood pressure and Tai Chi's response to that, but that's just a very simple view. And then on the other side, so just settle down with your weight in the middle. So you have this impression, this idea, this image in your head of what it's like to stand upright with your weight sinking down. This is the standard position. And then moving into your back leg and just let yourself go up and down a little bit to re-establish that awareness of the push from, your, from the ground. And each time you go down, like with exercises that we did earlier, the sinking down, there's that sense of just settling for a moment. So again, rooting down, centering, goes beyond just a physical act and becomes this body-mind process of just settling in into the ground and quieting down. And then level off a little bit. Raising your toes and your heel. Remember, not tight anywhere through your body and stepping in. And then take a few steps through. And then going back. Oops. 
and the shaker. So that settling down is actually almost the opposite to a standard adrenaline reaction, which is where you know we're kind of like that. You know, we we you you go to cross the road and somebody bibs at you, and you kind of do 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 that. Those kind of things occur regularly to us day in day out for all sorts of reasons. The cars bibbing, letters from the bank manager, other just you know, what's on the news. There's all sorts of things that 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 create stress and. In, in some cases, if, if there really is a car about to run, about to run you over, this kind of action that pumps the, the, the adrenaline in into your muscles and enables you to make a leap further than you've ever let before, or that kind of thing, is actually very useful. But that's about all it's useful for. If it's the letter from the bank manager, or the, you know, the ongoing situation that you've got to deal with, or I, 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 there's, 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 there's all sorts of things. Actually, repeatedly pumping adrenaline in into your system really wires you and it's it, it's not a great idea um adrenaline is very limited in its response and I've, I've i've talked to people who do martial arts sparring you know they get in the ring and they put gloves on and so on and so forth and they say that actually what they're trying to do is to cut through the adrenaline adrenaline is fight flight or freeze that's all those are your options it's very, very primitive, but you, you, you have to take the energy of that and be a bit more creative with it, they reckon, in, in the ring. I think it's a bit like that in, in life. This is why my first teacher, Bronwyn, used to say to us, you know, you'll find yourself standing like this in supermarket queues. You know, when the stress levels go up, you don't want to stand there like that. You want to kind of discharge that, that, that adrenaline cycle. And so this thing about sinking down and when i talk about you know if you like the, the, the mind aspects of it that sense of releasing that sense of calming just breaks that cycle the, the a typical adrenaline cycle only lasts about a minute just over a minute and it's 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 quite interesting what often happens is we reinforce it you know we stand in the supermarket queue and we get a bit uptight and then we 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 where you get out and it bothers you and you say, you know, you bump into the, I just had to stand half an hour in the supermarket and suddenly you've triggered that response again. Or you're constantly thinking about the situation that is coming up that you've got to deal with or some, some, something like that. Um, touching base every now and then, touching that sense of being centred just introduces that little bit of quietness and that little bit of stillness and breaks it breaks that, that 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 cycle and that stillness is reflected in the arms this brings us right back to not flapping your arms around but actually taking your attention down we ground the energy we ground the the, the anxiety if you like we ground the the adrenaline so have one foot forwards each time we transfer the weight there's just a moment a split second which is so valuable of settling you settle into your back foot, hands at your sides, rotated palms forwards, and bird folds its wings. No hurry. You wait until you feel the compression in your legs, reaching a point where to hold it anymore would be discomfort. And so you just allow yourself to be moved. A nice steady rhythm begins to settle in. So we begin to change our responses to all sorts of factors in, in our lives that may, may lead us to be anxious or strain in some way or or another not by making them go away or ignoring them by just taking some time out from them initially so i think this still aspect where urged in the tai chi classics to seek the stillness within the movement not to flap our arms around but to seek the stillness 
is actually one of the big attractions in our culture. There's so many things around that can stress us, that having something that just counters that a, a, a little bit is immensely valuable. And then change into fisherman cast a net. The other thing about that quietness is that it enables us to get that overview of the landscape, both internal and external. And so we're more likely to be able to look for those creative responses, those creative solutions. And if we just sort of go flying off at the handle as the saying goes. and then pushing away. This is not to suggest that all sources of stress and so on and so forth are simply ours to deal with. There are many things out there that could be changed. If you're working in a job that you hate, when you're being mistreated, if your living accommodation is bad, and so all of those kind of things are still factors and still need to be dealt with either by yourself or by the society at large. But we, we still have some control over our responses. Okay, and then okay. I came across in a little book of Proverbs in a friend's house, you know, these little tiny books and they have these sayings and um, a, a saying that was described as a Chinese proverb, whether it is or not, I don't know. But it was that the, that, that the birds of, of worry and care fly around your head, you cannot change. That they build nests in your hair, this you can do something about. And Tai Chi is about not letting those nests get 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 built. I'm not sure you can't change the birds flying around your head personally, but anyway, you know what I mean. On the other side, sink back. And bird folds its way. And then fisherman cast a net. Remember that moment of just settling each time your weight arrives in one of your legs. and pushing away. wave. 
So everything I've, I've talked about today, the quietness of the arms, the turning from the center, the attention we pay to, to the posture, all contribute to that quality of stillness within the movement. It's not either or. But the stillness and the movement need each other. One more time. Check. Rubbing your hands together. Tapping over your face. And over your head. Down to one shoulder and your arm. Other side. Go back. And around your hips. Light on your belly. Oh, yeah, the chest. I think I first realized Tai Chi's potential in this area. Um, not long after I started teaching with uh, the feedback from a student, I was asked to do some workshops for a local community college, which I was, at the time I was reluctant to do. I wasn't sure that you could do a lot in a day. Um, but I, I finally agreed to do a series of three workshops. Um, and somebody who came to the first one, she came back to the second one. And she was saying to me, she told me what had happened, that she'd, she'd, she had some kind of executive job. Um, and she was due to give a presentation at a conference. And she said she was on her way to the conference, got stuck in traffic. So she was going to be late. And, I mean, we've all done that. We've all been in that situation. There's nothing you can do about it. You're just... Right there. Um, but she finally got to the conference center and she said, you know, she, sort of, she sort of like pulled her car, jumped out the car, grabbed her bag, ran into the conference center, got as far as the, the doors in, in, into the actual room. And she said she suddenly remembered the Tai Chi workshop she'd done and how she felt then. And she said she just sat down on a chair outside the door and sort of sorted out her posture, let herself relax took a few deep breaths, felt much better, got up, walked into the conference hall, walked up the front and said, sorry, I'm late. I got stuck in traffic and everybody went, oh yeah, we know that. She said, it, she, she, she was still a bit, she was still late. She wasn't going to be early. She was already going to be late. She was maybe a minute or two later, but she felt much better. She said, I gave a really good presentation. Nobody turned around and said, why are you late? Because everybody knows you get stuck in traffic. You can't do much about it. And I thought that was really interesting that after a day, she actually, for me, kind of struck to what I would consider one of the one of the really key points about Tai Chi, this ability that it has to encourage us to, to just quieten, to center, to settle whatever image you 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 you, you care to put to, to put on it. So embrace tiger return to the mountain. This this encapsulates this whole experience. The tiger being the end, just the, the wild energy of everyday life, some people say. And the mountain, of course, this lovely image of stillness, quietness, space, again, whatever image works for you. And notice, even as you push up, there's the pull of gravity. That if you're sensitive to it and aware of how it's working through your body, the resolve not to strain against it will eventually just draw you back. So even as you push up, there's 
going to be a point in this cycle where you end up back down and once again you settle just feel the quietness feel your legs responding and then once again you you push up you feel the the interrelated quality of both if you like yin yang the, the the two aspects the movement and the stillness the movement takes us into stillness stillness leads us to the movement One more time. And rest. Lovely. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Mike. Very helpful. Really good. Well, as